collecting and preparing. Whoa. Oh, I'm recording that. Is that okay? Okay, sorry. Uh, so Gary is here to talk to us about collecting and preparing native plant seeds for sowing. And by day, Gary works as a principal project manager at Sanofi Genzyme. The rest of the time, he is an avid home gardener, deeply concerned about saving native plants and our pollinators. He is a founding member of the Watson Park Pollination Preservation Group, whose members have reclaimed the abandoned pollination garden on Lyman Street in Northboro, and they have also installed an adjacent native plant meadow this year. He has developed his expertise in seed collecting and sowing in the course of sourcing plants for these projects, and he has shared his work with the Southboro and Worcester native plant groups as well. Um, hold on. So Gary has very generously provided his slideshow with live links um, and a spreadsheet of seed collection details by seed species in a Google Drive folder, which we have put into the chat so that to help you all prep for our upcoming seed swap, which will be the weekend of November 5th or 6th, we're not sure yet, uh, 1 to 4 p.m., which he will also be at to do demos and offer advice. So stay tuned for details and take it away, Gary. Oh, I just wanted to say about questions. If you have questions, pop them into the chat and Brucey will uh, monitor them. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you for inviting me to present to your group tonight. Um, uh, like like you said, we're we're saving the environment one one seed at a time, and the process starts right now because this is a great time to start seed collecting. We we've, we've missed the 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 flowers that bloomed in the spring, but all the summer bloomers are ready to collect now. So it's the great time to start. So that's what we're learning tonight is the uh, process to collect the seeds, then <clears throat> clean the seeds and package them. And this is really a pay it forward project. It's, it's all about knowledge sharing and helping our pollinators. Um, and please continue to teach your neighbors, your friends and your family about the native plants and our native pollinators. If, if someone gives you free seeds, grow those seeds, collect the seeds and then give them to your friends. And that's my story. That's how I got started two years ago when I propagated using the winter sow method for the first time. So I'm I'm new at this. I've I've been studying this for for two years, and I'm just doing knowledge sharing with what I've learned. I made a lot of mistakes that first year. I was overwhelmed with all the internet resources. Um, the native plant groups that I joined, they were making my head spin at the at the monthly meetings. I didn't I couldn't tell what the difference were and, and what the ag agendas were that were different about them. And maybe some of you are beginners too, and you can relate. <clears throat> but I did the best I could. And most importantly, I let the plants teach me. Um, and they showed me my mistakes. It, it it all started behind my house when I was installing a rock garden on this steep rocky cliff that grew lots of weeds. I, I painted all these, um, well, similar to these uh, garden rock markers. And when I transplanted the 20, over 20 uh, plants in that rock garden behind my house, everything either died that first summer or in the winter. So this spring and summer, I was just looking at a bunch of rock garden tombstones, but I didn't give up. Um, and the, the, the two or three species that did make it through the winter made me so happy. And I've been on a mission ever since to normalize this winter sow method for the beginners to give them a better experience in, than I had. Um, there's a lot of material to cover tonight, and I'm going to go through kind of quickly. But the most important part is this: the third, the last part, the packaging, because um, if if you're distributing distributing these seeds, it is not intuitive the the seed density, and if you don't get that right, then um, then you're you're kind of setting yourself up for failure. <clears throat> so the uh, first thing you need to do is identify 
the plant, especially if you're distributing this, the seed. And the best time to do that is when it's in bloom, like uh, grasses and sedges, it's, it's almost impossible to ID that until if it's not in flower, because we have over 50 native sedges alone. Um, so if you can get a picture of that when it's in bloom, it will help identify it. And another personal example I have just this year, uh, I personally collected winter sowed and transplanted into my garden, um, the blue lobelia, purple giant hyssop and uh, scarlet bee balm. And when it bloomed, um, it wasn't what I thought. So had I um, had I not visited that those plants when they when they flowered, um, I wouldn't know that that instead I had white, I had some white lobelia mixed in, and and the uh, purple giant hyssop had anise hyssop mixed in, and um, the scarlet bee balm. They were all the wild berbergamot. So I have no idea what happened, but it's just it's really critical when you when you're doing these techniques, um, you have to have your wits about you and and don't cross-contaminate, don't mislabel. Um, but that's an example of like why you need to ID when, when it's in bloom, because these plants, they look the same, like blue lobelia, white lobelia. You can't tell a difference until they flower. And I, I like to use a, a the plant app called Picture This. It's my favorite one. Um, take lots of pictures, uh, photograph the stems, leaves, and flowers, and uh, Sometimes I'm I'm at a place where I don't have internet access, so I just take pictures, and I can process those later, either when I have clean hands or more time or internet access. But in, until this year, I didn't, I didn't, I never looked close enough at these plants. I didn't know that some stems were hairy and some weren't. Like this is wrinkle leaf goldenrod, and that's a attribute that will help you identify that it's wrinkle leaf just by looking at the stem. So pay real close attention when you're trying to ID. Your, your plants, uh, details like that. Once you do idea, have the discipline to, to um, label it, like that plant marker, New England Aster. Um, don't do it like I do, like uh, forget to do it. And then a couple of weeks later, have to ID it again because I forgot. So just have the discipline to do it once and save some time later. Um, now there are other resources you can cross-reference if you're not sure, because it is tricky to ID these some of these plants is to cross-reference with books, websites. There are a lot of Facebook groups out there that can help or dichotomous key. That's a new one for me. And I'll talk about that one a little bit in the, the next slide. One resource that I'm sure you all know is the GoBotany site. That's my go-to site for um, <clears throat> understanding if a plant is native to New England. And that top picture shows by county where they're native. It also shows where they've where they are located, just uh, not native. Um, so that's a little nuance that they track. Um, and the bottom map there shows where it's native to the United States. In this example, blue lobelia, um, it's native to almost all of the United States. But when when we collect seeds for for uh, sowing here, you want to collect it locally and or buy it from a seed company that's that's uh, local to us. And I have some references on the last slide because seeds have genetic variations from where they evolved. A, 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 plot, a blue lobelia that evolved in Texas, it, have, it could have a genetic variation that influences the timing of when the foliage comes, when the pollen and nectar are produced. And, in our pollinators, they're looking for um, that at a specific time. Like, yes, um, uh, wild bergamot flowers through many, many summers, but some, some plants are more specific and those um, pollinators might need it at a certain time when other things aren't, aren't in bloom. Also impacts its hardiness zone, like a, a blue lobelia from Texas that may not survive one of our cold winters, if you brought a seed or a plant up from there. Um, <clears throat> and if, if you search by the plant, I searched Joe Pai uh, on that GoBotany site. If you choose the genus, you, there'll always be a genus. You might have to go to the different screens, 
But if you choose the genus, that's you'll get this screen here, and it will list all the the ones needed in New England. And there are four, four of uh, Joe Pye's native here. Um, coincidence that on the screen before it did list four, but um, just because there are only four, they all fit on that page. But um, this link, this link here for the dichotomous key, if you're, it's an advanced feature to identify plants, but if you if it's really important, you can you can give it a, a go. Hit the button, and then this bottom screen will come up, and it will give you a series of questions that will help you identify exactly which species you have. And it has these um, pop-ups where you hover over the word that you may not know what it means, and it has a, a pop-up with a picture and a definition to help you navigate what all these questions are. Like this first one, for example, it's does this the seed head is it flat on the top and if it is then it's the common spotted joe pie and if it isn't then it's you choose this lead and it and it's one of the other three and then it will have the next question like does it have a hairy stem um so i'm not i'm not good at this i tried it a couple of times it is more advanced than where i'm at right now but it is something that this winter i i want to learn more about um, for the seed collection, so this is broken down into two groups. This first group is seed collection and cleaning, and then lastly is the packaging. So here's the basically shopping list for for the first part, the the seed collection and cleaning. And there's another list later on. Uh, you you would like to get paper bags, either big ones from the grocery store or lunch sacks. Um, for school lunches. So this is the one time of year that I don't feel guilty by leaving my reusable bags in the car and asking for the paper bags because paper is um, permeable to moisture. So you can leave the seed heads in that paper bag and, and um, they will dry in there. Unlike plastic, you don't want to use plastic for uh, seed storage. Pen or marker, you have to have the discipline to label the the seed heads when you when you collect don't put them in your car and expect to remember because you've just collected five different species and um it's just a train wreck if you try to if you don't id right um when you collect pruners i this is my favorite kind it's kind of a light duty one but it's in it but they're sharp and small but for for a big seed head you want a more hefty um hefty pruner to the big stems. <clears throat> There's a picture later for the mesh bags and twist ties we'll talk about. You need to have space to keep organized, either a milk crate to put your bags in or a cleared shelf. Um, <clears throat> a plastic shaker is one of your um, best friends with uh, seed cleaning. Paper plates, non-glossy, just uh, like this. Non-glossy meaning it doesn't have a laminate of plastic on it because you want, you don't want it so slippery. You want some friction. In fact, when when you use it for a while, the the uh, fibers on here um, fray and uh, it becomes more hairy and actually improves the efficiency when you're when you're using the paper plate. So um, that's a link to what I use. And then sieves and sieves or kitchen strainers. Um, and that's a link to the sieve set that I that I use. <clears throat> uh, when to collect, you, you want to visit the plants frequently after they bloom, and they will tell you when it's time to collect. Um, you, you may get find a reference on the web that says, you know, in October or September, but just visit that plant frequently, like every few days. And when the seed heads turn brown, um, that's an indication when they start dropping their seeds on their own. And I've got some pictures showing that. Um, that's definitely like, that's your last chance to, to collect from that plant. A lot of times I'll sacrifice some. I'll just grab some of the seed hex uh, and then do a technique called hand rub, hand rub that we'll talk a lot about. Put it in your hand and just rub it until the, um, the shaft breaks or the calyx breaks and then you'll it'll expose the seed. Um, so not only are you checking if it's if the seed is um, dry, 
because you can tell if it, if it's not dry yet, it will be um, it's kind of you you can you will feel that it's too moist and not ready. But also more importantly is make sure there is seed. Um, last year I made a couple of mistakes. I collected a lot of from what um, prunella and uh, love grass and uh, there was no seed. And I, I didn't know why I wasn't getting germinations because the seed had dropped out already. I didn't know back then about checking for the seed. Um, and also when, when the seeds are ripe and ready to come out, any wind storm um, rain is gonna knock the seed out. So given the choice, collect before that, that storm happens. <clears throat> we want to collect ethically. Um, and some rules of thumb are you outside of a planted garden, like it's it's kind of a different conversation if it's in your garden and you planted it there. But if you if you're finding it in nature, uh, no more than 10% of seeds from that one plant. Uh, don't collect from private property or parks without permission. And if you find a state listed plant and there's a link to, to them and there are a lot, that means they're endangered. Uh, you're not allowed to collect from them no matter what. You can't get permission to collect from those. <clears throat> and if you do collect from them, it's illegal. And if you grow those seeds and collect from that plant, that's illegal too, but you can you can buy seeds of these state listed plants. You can buy plants, grow those, and then you're legally allowed to collect the seeds from them. And these uh, these are for examples um, the northeast beard tongue. That's one of the few that um, that made it through the winter last summer in the winter. So in it it bloomed this year in the early summer. Uh, so that's in my rock garden. The goldenrod and lobelia, those are state listed and those are in adjacent to my driveway. It's what I call the terrace garden. It was a really steep part of my property that I didn't enjoy mowing. So I um, I, bought, I got a bunch of uh, field stones and I terraced it. So I've got four different tiers of garden for native plants parallel in my driveway. And in the back, it's actually my neighbor's yard, but I planted a new pollination garden um, right there that you can see in the background. And then this, the purple giant hyssop, that's Watson Park. That's the garden, the community project that we put in in June where we, I gave out free pop propagation kits and the community uh, grew all the plants. So we were able to install it without any funding. <clears throat> and I'll talk about that in the packaging step, but those propagation kits with the, the milk jugs in the soil, in the, the seeds, each seed pack had seeds for two containers. And the, the catch was you keep one and donate one back to the project. So we'll talk more about that in a bit. Uh, when, when we collect, if you have the option, collect from different plants. Don't collect all from one plant. And that way you have a better genetic diversity in the seed bank that, you, that you've just collected. And then they get all mixed up. And then when you winter sow them, you're not just getting seedlings from one plant. And you have a better chance of the plants surviving if there's a disease. And uh, you want to specifically, if you can, collect from the short ones, the tall plants, the ones that bloomed early and the ones that bloomed late. Those are just some examples of how to choose the plants to collect from for better genetic diversity. Um, and I'm not a plant biologist, but I assume that if you collect seed from a short plant, maybe when it when it grows, it's also going to be short. I, I'm not sure, but um, and when when you collect, this is important enough to repeat. Label label the label the bag when you collect it with like species location and date. Um, I said it before, and it's it's really important um, to do that. Most seeds are collected dry when they're brown and 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 they're dry, but some are not. Like spice spice bush, blue bush, blueberry, maple leaf, vi viburnum. Those are not dry when you collect. Um, I I do not have. I do not have slides for, for those types, but I have 
tried them. I didn't, I, I was unsuccessful with the spice bush and the maple leaf viburnum, but I did successfully propagate the, the blueberry from, from seed. Um, the plants produce seed in, in many different ways. And, I, and I've got a slide describing uh, each uh, type um, that I have experience with. So in, in my two years with this new hobby, I don't have a lot of experience, but I do the, I, I am doing all native work. And in particular, it's a subset of that from for the at-risk at bees. Uh, it's Dr. Jagir's list. So that's when you see my examples, they're mostly his his plants, just because that's all I know. But what you learn tonight is transferable to um, to your other plants, non-natives, even in your garden. Like um, like fennel shape is very similar to um, like golden Alexander. So what you learn tonight is transferable to anything in your garden that you want to collect seeds from. There, there are three uh, reoccurring um, ways that I, I see when I when I collect seeds. One is kind of like gardening 101, what you've always known. It's deadheading. So you, uh, with your pruners, cut the seed head, put it in the bag, and then dry it for later. It's also probably the most labor intensive later um, when, because now you've got to clean the seed in, on your in your kitchen, on your table. Um, whereas some of these other methods, you can clean it in the field, which will save you a lot of time. So mo mo I'd say most seeds are probably this deadhead category. I've listed a bunch here, including milkweed, but I will show an example of milkweed, how to clean it in the field. Um, another one is if, if a plant has uh, flowers up a stem, you can grab it with your fist and just rake it, rake it off by pulling all the seed heads. And then you've got a fistful of, of seed that you just chuck in your bag. And all the examples here, except for the lobelias, you have to further process, but the rest of them, you're done. That's the that's seed cleaning and you don't have to clean it further. And then the last one, this one is 100% field cleaned. Um, you you dead you you can uh, deadhead the the thing and then stick it down in the bag, shake it because the seeds are fluffy and, and these are like the windblown seeds. Shake it in the bag and with your other hand, you can even pick the seeds off, and all that fluff is in the bag, and now you're ready to um, to package. There's no more cleaning with these ones. Bonset, goldenrod, joe pie, asters. Shaft does have inherent moisture, and if you collect in the morning, it has dew, or if it had sprained recently, it's wet. And these will mold. So if you're collecting a lot, like this picture here, I put it on, on a shelf for a couple of days to let it dry. Um, if you're not collecting bulk seed like that, you can just leave it in the bag, paper bag, and it will, it will dry. It will be just fine. Um, milkweeds are prone to mold. Those are particularly important to let air dry. But I mentioned there's, you can field clean those. So I'll, I'll give you an example show you how to do it um, in the field to separate that shaft. Um, and on this cardinal flower, if I don't know, can you see my cursor? Yes. That uh, dark thing there, that's the seed. That is dust-like small seed. And just the, just dumping it out and spreading it on that cardboard, all those seeds came out. So some of these seeds are teeny tiny um, so you have to really take care with, with seeds like that because they will fall everywhere out the bottom of the bag. And this, this one on the, on the right, I collected those early summer, the purple bee balm. Um, I don't think it's a state listed, but it's uh, definitely, um, rare. And I left it, I left it in a plastic container with a lid on and it did get moldy. I'm going to 
I'm going to sow the seeds anyway, cross my fingers, but that's kind of what you're looking for. Um, <clears throat> this is a the picture on the right. That's that's in my garage storing the, the seeds last last winter. You, you want to keep organized. Do it either put them in alphabetical order, um, separate them on by shells, like which were field cleaned versus which ones are unclean and you have to process again. Uh, and very important, those small cardinal flower, lobelias, small seeds, probably want to put those on the bottom shelf because those seeds will vibrate out of the bag, uh, the, the um, seams of the bag and, and contaminate whatever's below it. So that's important. <clears throat> Be mindful of that. If you're collecting again with that same species, uh, do yourself a favor and locate that bag, plan ahead, locate that bag and just collect into the same because it's it's tough when you end up having two or three bags of the same species. Because if you're doing it large scale, like I did, I I, I collected a lot of seeds last year for um, for these winter sow programs in the in the area, and um, that was a lot to manage. It was a lot of bags that I had. <clears throat> so, and if you do end up with multiple bags, you want to co-locate them. Uh, just so when it goes time to seed clean, you you can get them all done in one batch. Um, and the the next slide, you're going to see a picture of uh, bulk seed. And look at the difference between storing this, all those bags, versus that upper right. So it's a lot safer and easier to store when you have clean bulk seeds. So you you don't you want to do that sooner than later. Um, so you don't run the risk of a, the bag tipping over because that's a lot safer to store in its bulk. And seed cleaning, it's the process of removing the chaff and debris and yielding clean bulk seed. This bottom right is wild bergamot. When you do a hand rub, that's what it looks like. There's a lot of debris in there and a few seeds. Seed cleaning is the process of separating the, the seeds out. And it's your discretion how clean you make that bulk. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a time consuming process. So you can spend not much time and have a lot of chaff and debris in there, or you can uh, take the time to get clean bulk seed. It, it's, it's your discretion. But if, you, if you're following the steps, um, the instructions I have, it's assuming clean bulk seed. And that's important because it normalizes this packaging step. It makes it repeatable because we are we are uh, measuring with um, little spoons. So you, if you're if you're scooping out 100% seed versus 50% seed, 50% debris it makes a difference how many seeds are going in that the envelope. <clears throat> When you're when you're doing this work, you want to work with one species at a time to to avoid uh, cross contamination. If you if you're cleaning, you don't and seeds will hop out. And you don't want an adjacent bag there where the seeds going to contaminate that bag. And uh, it, it's important to when you're finished cleaning that species, have a vacuum cleaner or a shop vac nearby and and clean all your equipment and the bench. That way, when the next seed comes, if it spills on the bench, you, you can safely scoop it up and, and add it back. And uh, lastly, on this slide, a good storage technique is to put, put your bulk seed in the refrigerator until it's time to package. If you don't put it in the fridge, then put it somewhere cool. Like don't, don't leave it in the windowsill where it's getting sunlight. That'd be the worst place to put it. So the basement garage, um, refrigerator if you have room. Several species are cleaned in the field, and if it's not, it would be called post-collection post seed cleaning, and it's time-consuming. I, um, I have another slide uh, showing how, how long it does take to clean a, a species when we get to the grasses. You, you want to take breaks because the whole time you're doing it, you're looking down, and 
you can injure your neck if you if you go for too long um, without breaks. So um, be aware of that. I mentioned before about this the hand rub technique. You 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 do this a lot, and what that means is you put the shaft in your hand and then you just rub it in the palms of your your hand like that until it will breach that thin shaft like you see on that common self heel or it will break the calyx like it, like that bee bomb that on that previous slide and uh and you actually want to do that while you're collecting because i i collected the self heel last year a lot of it didn't have any seed in it because we we just didn't understand that at the time we I thought that was the seed, what you're, the big shaft there that you're seeing in this picture. I thought that was the seed. That's not. Um, and I've, I've got three different cleaning methods to show. After these cleaning methods, we'll begin, we're going to go through one slide per species. Uh, and, but these cleaning methods, they, they will be used for all, all of these. So we're going to talk about them first. So when we get to the other slides, you'll understand what this is about. So that for the shaker method, the, uh, you put the seed heads in the container and just shake it. And then you're gonna dump that container into your sieve or, um, or strainer. And the seeds will likely drop out and the shaft stays. You'll want to wear a dust mask. Everyone has those around with COVID these days. So you want to put that on when you open that lid because it, it makes debris that becomes airborne so you, and you don't want to breathe that because it's concentrated when you open that lid. And then if you, if you want to collect more, you, you may have plenty of seed when you do this, but if you want to recover more, like 5% more, you can put the seed head back with some bolts, I, I wouldn't use rocks because when they hit each other, they break and they make additional debris. Something hard like bolts and nuts, you can put in there and, and shake and hold that lid when you do it because those will make that lid come off. And important to reach down and remove those before you dump it into your sieve because you don't want to, something heavy like that damaging your equipment. So that's the shaker method. You'll use that a lot. Paper plate, you use these in combo combination because um, the, the shaker, now you've got all that debris and you need to separate it. So you're either gonna use the paper plate method or the sieve method, which is that the next slide. For this one, uh, an old plate is better because it becomes soft. And I, I even, if I have a new plate, I'll, I'll sand it with sandpaper just to get that the fibers um, starting to, to fray. And you'll put the seed on there. I don't have seed, but, and you just shake it like that. And you wanna shake it fast enough so the seed, which is usually round, rolls, but slow enough so that the shaft doesn't roll. That's, that's the skill um, to make this process work and then repeat it. Uh, you, you'll see on the picture there, that's 36 seeds. Um, if you have a small batch, you can shake that so it's concentrated in one spot, put your thumb on it, and then over the compost, dump the rest of the shaft and your, your seeds are safe on your thumb. Then flip it the other way and then do it again. And then dump that shaft. So you kind of flip the plate back and forth until you get it clean enough. If you have a big batch, then like the other picture, uh, I have the shop back go and I do this work in my garage. I have the shop back and I'll just vacuum that shaft right off and then flip the plate and do it again. And I'll keep doing that until I, and it's clean enough. But each time you do it, you're gonna lose some seeds. So you don't wanna do it too many times because you're, you're collecting 80% shaft, 20% seed or so. So you don't want to do it too many tons, but um, that's how you do a small batch versus a big batch with the 
with this. Also, if it's a really big batch, and I don't have a good picture of it, but I wish I wish I did. If it's a really big batch, when you get the seeds concentrated at the bottom, you if there's a lot of shaft still in there, then it that rose rises to the top because the seed is small, heavy, and it goes to the bottom and the shaft goes to the top. And you can skip that shaft layer off with your finger, and that will be mostly shaft and just compost that and it leaves the seed. Then you can repeat and and you'll have less shaft each time you, you um, come down the plate. Um, and what, once you get the seed uh, clean, you can use the envelope and kind of cup it, dish it, cup it like that, and then use that to scoop your seed out. It works really well. And label it. The third and final method is the sieve method. You can use a, a kitchen strainer like that, or the sieves. Um, and I have a link on that on the um, shopping list page for the sieve set that I use. And the the idea is that you put the bigger mat the the wider mesh at the top and the small mesh and then finally the pan at the bottom. So the shaft stays on the top. The debris usually is smaller and goes to the bottom and the seeds are in the middle. And that's the way to separate. And then, and then you'll most of the time have to dump that into the paper plate and then further clean it. <clears throat> and it's important to vacuum all your equipment when you're finished because you don't want to cross-contaminate the ne next batch of seed, including the shaker. Don't forget to vacuum that the inside of that shaker. The, the 35 mesh um, is the, uh, the smallest you'll, you'll need, and that's like window screen. So if you, if you want to make your own and have a, a screen around, you can just start with that because that's the main one you're going to use or go to the sec second hand store and just find a strainer like that. And that will do almost everything you need to do with like small seed. But if you want to get fancy, you can invest in sieve set like this, that this, unfortunately the set comes with like three times that number. They get really small and bigger than that too. But these are the main ones. You really don't need that five either. So that's why I have it in phantom on the left there, five, 10, 35. So it's just that 10 will collect the big stuff, 35, and then the pan. And I also tried the, what they call Japanese soil filters. And I returned them because um, they, it sounds like a great idea, but I forget why, but I think the quality wasn't there. It's the kind that has one, one um, container and then you change out the, the screen mesh. Um, great concept, but it just didn't work out and I returned it. Okay, now we're into the, the seed. So one, one slide per type, and this, this type is called the umbrella type. It would be your Golden Alexander, Metozizia. And I apologize, I talk in common plants. I'm not Latin. Um, name because um, I'm, a, I'm a newbie at this. And if you're in your herb garden, fennel is the same shape. Grab it in your fingers and just pluck them, pluck them right off, leave the seed head. And uh, you'll do that before the seeds drop. You can see this example, those middle ones, those middle umbrella spokes, the seeds fell off already. So if you see that, it's time to collect because the rest are about to uh, go as soon as a bird lands on them. Um, and if you choose to not do it like this or someone collected for you and gives you a bag of these, it's tricky because when you, they get all intertwined in the bag, all these seed tags, and when you pull them out, they're so dry that these seeds will start flicking everywhere and fling and you'll lose them. So given the choice, collect, clean it in the field then just use the sift for paper plate method to clean it. Also, when you do that, you'll see some seeds are smaller. Um, I, I 
assume those real small ones are not viable or less viable. So I, I compost those ones and only keep the ones that are like uniform, big um, looking. Uh, this is partridge pea, it's pea pod shape, and there are a lot of them. You can see how many, this is three or four plants in my, in my uh, terraced garden. These are ready to collect when you, you shake it and you hear it rattle, it means the seeds are dry. And you want to collect before the, the pod splits open. On these ones on the bottom that are lighter color, half of that fell off and the seeds dropped already um, the, and the seeds are baked. So I'm gonna have probably, this is an annual. So I'm gonna have a lot of seedlings of this one coming up in the spring, which I, I don't want. I want two or three plants and that's it. So I was too late to, uh, to, to uh, get to these. I, I got plenty of seeds and then I deadheaded the rest because I don't want a thousand seedlings in that part of my garden. <clears throat> uh, this is, group is uh, wind dispersed, meaning it's um, fluffy and the wind will carry it when it's when it's ripe. These particular ones we're talking about are milkweeds, um, uh, butterfly weed, swamp milkweed, and common milkweed. You collect them this time, like October, and the seed pods will split open when they're ripe. Or if you gently squeeze them and it splits open, then that tells you that it's ripe, that they're ripe and the seeds will be dark brown. And personally, I think the best way to collect these is to monitor two of them every couple of days. And when they open, which I'm gonna go quickly to the next slide and then I'll come back. They, it looks like that. This this was is my side yard and the half of the pod just came right out. I, I saw it at just the perfect time and I collected. Um, but if if it's at a place where you don't, you can't get to very often, you can use these twist ties. Um, photo credit is uh, Ken who joined us. Thank you, Ken, for that great idea. Uh, then you, know, you don't have to ri risk of uh, losing the seeds by, by wind. I tried rubber bands this year and it did not go well. I bought small rubber bands and they were still two times too big. So then I had to double them up and try to get them down on that pod. And it was just really hard. Um, and then I went back a few weeks later to check them and all the rubber bands broke. So I don't know if they weren't, if it was this UV rays from the sun disintegrated it and they broke, or if there was a chemical reaction from the rubber versus the outside. It was a disaster, so I collected them all, and I won't do that again, but I do like this um, bread tie method. It would be a lot easier to put on, and um, this, yeah, that, that's a good choice. And when, when you deadhead these, be careful not to grab it and just yank it off the plant, because this happened to me lat the other day. I did that, and it shook the plant in the adjacent one, um, it shook it and all the seeds went blown in the wind and landed on that rock. And no, I didn't bother trying to pick it up because that's just takes too much time for, <laughs> for that. But just be, be careful and mindful uh, because when these are ripe, they are ready to go. This is the, this is the method for collecting it the seed in the field for the milkweeds. If you pinch the top side of the flower head, the shaft, not the stem side where it attaches, but the top side, grab that shaft with your finger, your thumb, then you can rake the seeds right off and they fall right off. That way you don't have to do uh, seed cleaning. But if you do have, if someone gives you a bag of these and you have to clean them, Put it in a shaker with bolts and shake it like that, but do it. Don't do it inside because that the shaft will go everywhere. Um, so you you really want to do this in the field while you're collecting, so you don't have to mess with that fluff. Other wind dispense dispersed seeds are um, goldenrods, ironweed, boneset, joe pie, asters, thistle, um, blazing star, 
there are a lot fireweed pearly everlasting when you collect them when they're fluffy like that picture on the right and uh if you if you cut the stem put it in the bag and just shake shake it and that way you don't have to you can then compost the, uh, the stem in the field in, or in your compost pile. You don't have to store it. Or if it's small, like the calico aster, shove it in the bag. You don't even have to cut the stem, just shove it in the bag and then just hand rub, massage and the enough seeds will, um, will go into the bag. Um, and then some species like dense blazing star, that's a wind dispersed. You can um, you can recognize that it's flower heads going up a stem. Just grab it with your fist and just pull up and all those will come in. You have a fistful of seed, toss that in your bag. And those are field cleaned. Don't have to do that later. Cone flower, uh, it, it, they don't call it cone flower because of what you see here. They call it cone flower, this picture on the upper right, because under that is a cone, is a cone base, and that's why it's a cone flower. Um, and what you see about this time of year is on the outside, it's, it's chaff. You're not looking at the seed. Those things that I picked off with my hand, that's the chaff. You don't, the, the seed is... Um, within that structure uh, where my mouse is, uh, uh, pointer is, if you if you pick that apart, that's this bottom picture, you can see where it had attached to the cone. And these long rectangular black things, two millimeters and hard, that's the seed. And then this lighter color, it's it's like the structure of it holding everything in place. And then the shaft, it's these four skinny tall ones um, also attached to that cone. And they're skinnier on the bottom because it has to go adjacent between that structure and the seed. And the top is wider. Uh, when it gets above the seed, it's wider. It creates a plug. And that's what keeps the seed in. And this time of year when it dries up and that shaft comes off, then the seeds can pop out when a bird lands on it. Um, so uh, you do that about this time of the year, the seed is the smaller, um, smaller, harder part, not the shaft part that you, that's thin, the, the shaft to test it, you can grab some and just put it in your finger. And if it turns into debris, then that's the shaft because a, a seed is hard and it won't turn into debris like that. So shake your method and then your trays to, to clean it. Um, and you want to separate those, pro uh, process those with a paper plate separately because what falls to the pan, it's almost all seed, but most of the stuff will be on that window screen layer, the 35 um, tray, and it was like 50% seed and 50% shaft, and I couldn't separate it. So that one, it's uh, it's it's gonna it's what goes in the envelope is 50% seed, and. Then if, if you want more, you can shake it again with the bolts. And I found a reference that Grow It, Build It guy, um, who's a rock star as far as seed cleaning. He said that when you shake it with the bolts, he, he basically composted the first batch and then because he didn't want to clean it. And then he said that the second batch is 100% seed, but when I did it last night, it was the same, 50% seed, and I can't separate it. So maybe you have better uh, better luck than I did. That was tough. <clears throat> uh, the square species one, those are the mint family. Wild bergamot, bee balm, hairy wood mint, hyssop. They all have a square stem. And um, this wild bergamot, the when the petals fall off and it becomes brown, that's when to collect. And uh, the, the seed is at the bottom of the calyx, which is this tube thing, tube part of the, the flower head. The seed's way at the base down there. And when you collect from this one, you'll see that some, the seeds are in different phases. Some will be in flower, some will be green and not ready. Some will be ready, 
and some will have already lost their seeds. So just pick the ones that are, are ready. And you can uh, sacrifice one ticket and just uh, shake it in your hand. If seeds come out, you know it's ready. You can shake it in the bag um, or deadhead and, and put it put it in the bag or both. Uh, another one, the, the pictures on the right, it's same camera setting. The bottom one is wild bergamot. The top one is scarlet bee bomb. You can see how much bigger the seed head is on that one. And to, to clean this, you shake it and then use the sieve to separate the debris and the seed. And if you want to do a second round, you can do it again with bolts. And when you do it with the bolts, it makes more debris. Um, and here, here's something interesting about scarlet bee bomb, probably why it's so rare. It's hard to collect the seeds because they fall out. This is one that you only have a couple of days to collect when they're ripe because they will fall out. And the reason is the calyx is three times, comparing to the wild bergamot, it's about three times bigger diameter than the wild bergamot. You can barely see the, the end of the calyx, whereas the scarlet bee bomb, it's huge. And the, the seed of the scarlet bee bomb is about three times smaller than the wild bergamot. Do you see these three seeds where my cursor is? Those three teeny tiny seeds wiggle right out of this seed head. Whereas the wild bergamot, that seed is like not much clearance. So it's, it, that seed stays in that uh, seed head a long time because it's tough to get out. Um, so that's why scarlet bee bomb seed is uh, hard to get. These are grasses. The grasses, uh, we've got two types. One is fluffy grass, and the next slide is tumbleweed grass. Fluffy would be native fluffy grasses, and these are only, I only know three grasses. So um, for native, but the big blue stem and little blue stem. The picture on the left, that's big blue stem taken just the other day. You can see that middle one is starting to turn. It's about ready. Um, and it will become, it will have some fluff to it, but not like the little blue stem, which is that October picture from last year. That's what little blue stem looks like. In that first slide of this presentation, that was little blue stem um, in a field. And then a couple months later, all those fluffy seeds will disperse and it will look like that without the, the fluff. And to collect this one, it's that seed, this that fist swipe. And you don't have to clean, just grab and uh, gently pull, remove the seed with your, with your fist. There's no cleaning. A little blue stem is the tumbleweed, meaning when it's ripe, it will break off and it will blow around like a tumbleweed. And that's how it, it spreads its seed. This picture on the, on the bottom, that's across from the street from the uh, uh, Watson Park garden that I, that I put in this year. And this is the hell strip. And it's really interesting because on the left is the road. And then it goes, there's a strip of Dallas grass and then a strip of love grass then a strip of poison ivy, and then a strip of, um, of um, honeysuckle, some invasive honeysuckle. <laughs> it was weird because it's a hell strip, but each of those plants have that sweet spot that they like. Maybe the Dallas grass can tolerate more, more salt than the love grass, but it, it was this strip and it wasn't planted because this is not maintained. It's like an industrial park um, and they don't even mow it. To, uh, to clean, so you'll collect it when it becomes brown and it breaks off like this middle picture. And uh, last year, I, this was another one I collected a lot of last year and I didn't get any germination because I thought that was the seed head. That's chaff. So when I collected, the seed was gone. So I did winter sow of chaff. No wonder I didn't get any germination. When you collect, do the hand rub and make sure there's seed. That's the seed on the, the far right. 
It's small, it's half a millimeter diameter, dark chestnut brown and round. That's what you're looking for. And this next slide, it's a case study for, for cleaning the love grass. That's, it's my favorite uh, shaker. I filled it with love grass from across the street, <laughs> the picture I just showed. And this took 35 minutes. It's a messy process that hand rub, and it's not easy because um, every every little handful you've got to rub. Every one of those seed heads you've got to rub to remove, which uh, took a lot of time. And shaft flies, so I instead of doing it on my workbench, I did it on the floor inside a bucket to contain it, and I still had that much dustpan worth of shaft that flew out when I did it. So I just added it back. And um, so you aggressively do the hand rub, then it's a sieve method and paper plate. Um, and that middle picture bottom, that's an example of when you, when you use the paper plate, uh, you can see the shaft layer on the top. That was at the end. I didn't think to get a picture while I was doing it, but it was a lot of uh, back and forth taking a lot of that shaft off, um, which was fun. Um, it's not hard. It's, it's like the most fun part of this whole process doing that bit. Um, but it, and it's, it was messy. I don't know why I got my hands all dirty from it, but it, it was, um, it was. That's how much shaft there was from the, stems and then that plate on the bottom right that uh light brown that's what i thought was seed last year that's the the little wheat shaft and then that's how much seed i got from it <clears throat> and that took 35 minutes so it's time consuming but it is a lot of seed uh, this group is hard seed pods your beard tongues, that Northeast beard tongue, that's a rare one. You saw a picture of that earlier. It's a short one and it's shade tolerant too. That's a good one. You collect them when they're rusty brown and that pod splits open and the seeds are really small. Uh, when you collect it, uh, uh, the first step is tip that bag over because you'll recover a lot of seeds that fell out when it's in that bag. So that's the first step, tip the bag thin shaker, um, you'll want to uh, use the, have the vacuum handy and vacuum a lot of the debris as you're going back and forth. Uh, and then if you want to, you can do the shaker with bolts and you might want to spot check after that, spot check a seed pod and see if there's any seed left in there. And if there is, you can take a garden trowel, which we all have handy and rock that over the seed heads. It's a convenient way to, uh, to really break that hard shell to expose the rest of the seeds. But there are a lot of seeds in here. So I think you'll be happy with just like first pass shaker, how many seeds you collect from that because you get a lot. These are disc like, uh, like, the, uh, like the milkweed with a disc shape. Uh, the, Closed bottle gentian and white turtle head are like that. This is a in bloom turtle head. It's not ready to collect. That will turn brown and start to crack when it's when it's ready. And to process that, you'll you want to um, aggressively break that shaft up to expose all those little bitty seeds. And when I did it last year, because they're not ready to collect right now, when I did it last year. There were a lot of eggs, like really tiny eggs. It was contaminated with some caterpillar uh, and the eggs all fell to that bottom pan. You wanna compost those and then you can separate the, the seeds. I hope I'm not going too fast, but I don't, I don't are we doing okay on time? Uh, we're losing a few people. Um, I know they have the, so how much more on this part? Cause you wanna have some Q and A. Yeah, I'm going through as quick as I can. It won't be too much longer. Okay, thanks. The soft seed pods, this is the type that you can just zip it up the stem with your hand, with your fist, and then uh, dry, and then 
shake it. Uh, these are really small. So this is the type you want to minimize the bag movement because the seeds will wiggle out and fall. You'll lose some. And when you when you grab that stem and pull up, if if it has shallow roots like this example, this monkey flower, I I uprooted it. So hold it down with one hand when you're swiping up with the other one. So you don't do that. That's another really small seed. The self heal we talked about before with the you do with the hand rub and make sure there's seed before you collect. Um, and then use either the tray or or even the paper plate to separate the seed. And it's small and round, and it will roll. These are hitchhikers. Um, Kelly will probably recognize this because I stole it from what she posted with the Soro uh, Drive. Uh, truck hitting the the bridge <laughs> it's a girl telling telling him that when you finish collecting the showy tick trefoil deadhead the rest of them because you forget it's there and you go on weed and next thing you know you've got an arm full of these velcro seeds on your on your arm so um when i had finished collecting i i do deadhead it just to save that aggravation but that's another one where you can hand swipe and remove it and you don't have to clean later besides picking off the little stems that might've broken off with it. And I think this is the last, yeah, the last type it's called ballistic type, meaning they they explode when they're ripe. This, uh, so jewelweed, wild geranium, lupin, violet, phlox, they, they all do this. This picture on the upper right, that's wild geranium. I was so excited. I went to my friends in Chelmsford and she had these in her garden. I was so excited that even though it was past, I thought there were seeds. Those are the, that's the shaft that those four things, the seed had opened up and they had already lost the seed. I thought, oh, they didn't fly off. They stuck. <laughs> so you have to know what you're looking for. So ones like this, uh, you put the jewelry bag <clears throat> over, over. I, I think that jewelry bag was earlier, but put it on, tie wrap it to collect those seeds before they explode. This, this bottom right, that's jewelweed. They actually call those vertical parts, and I drew black lines in Photoshop. They call that those the valves. So when that is ripe, those valves will open, and it actually, that sketch there shows the motion where when that valve opens the bottom part flicks up and kind of inverts like that and when it does that it flings the seeds straight up and out wow. um you you probably have seen that um it's kind of fun to when you find some ripe ones and this other picture that's a violet i had never seen a violet like that i never looked i was never got on my hands and knees to see what a violet looked like but when the when it's ripe that pod that looks like this if you look down at the very bottom uh, we'll have like five or six pods like that when they're ripe it splits into three and it has that many seeds so now is the time to collect those violet seeds because the a couple of days that will uh, all be spread on the ground Okay, now here's the last and most important, I think, part of this whole process is the packaging. These are these are things that I've bought to to do it. It's the mailing labels. It's a sheet with uh, thirty labels on there that size. Um, this is this is these are some seeds I bought last year. And when when you get it from the professional companies, they come with inside a wax envelope like folded up wax inside a Ziploc bag. I think that's overkill, but I will say that when I did it last year, I just used the label to hold the envelope closed and those small seeds, they come right out and it made a mess in that thing and probably cross-contaminated a bunch of seeds because the seeds were all coming out. Um, 
So I, I bought paper, I bought Ziploc bags this year. So I'll put the small dust like seeds in Ziploc bags, but you could make your own with wax paper like that. And then a measuring spoon set, like, like these mini, mini, mini measuring spoons. You need really small ones, but also collect other small things you have around. Like I had this from something from a few years ago and I don't know where I got this little lab spatula it is really small and this is what I use the most so um find find yourself some really small measuring spoons if you want to do this but the main the main point here is that it's not intuitive how densely to sow these seeds and the the seed density how closely these seeds are when you do the like a winter sow technique or even direct sow. It's a function of viability in good gardening practice to minimize the extra work in the spring. Um, and, and also what fits in the measuring spoon. It's all part of how many seeds I'd put in the envelope. But the, the, uh, the good gardening technique, what I mean by that is when we transplant these in the spring, it's using the hunk of seed method. It's the easiest way where if, if you have five or six seedlings and you can grab with a hunk, that's, that's good to put in that part of the garden. Then you do the same thing 12 inches apart with the next hunk. But if you have this mess like I had here with this steeple bush that I got 100% germination because I overseeded it and I didn't understand with the viability. If, if I had 5% germination, that would have been enough seeds, but I got 100%. So it was way too many seedlings. Um, so you have to understand all the germination uh, or the, the viability rate when you when you package, when you um, sow these. But the uh, you, you want to avoid, the hunk of seed method is great if you get the seed density right. Otherwise, to make this mess on the right successful, I would have had to, which I didn't do, I would have had to uh, transplant that into smaller pots, probably 50 pots with that many 200, I think I had 200 seedlings in there. I don't have time to transplant like that in the, in the spring. So they pretty much, when you have that and you, le you leave it like that all, all um, summer, the, the roots are too crowded and they don't grow. They just stay about that size all, all summer. So that was a, one of the big mistakes that I had made that first year. Um, and even the, even the native seed companies, like when, when I bought this from Toad Shade, they don't instruct on seed density. So, and their website also doesn't tell seed density. But, things like garden like uh, vegetable gardens they all tell you how how closely to to plant those seeds so the the point is that this is cutting edge technology this native plant work this has not been around for that many years so we we're figuring it out and uh, doing the best we can and um, that's why it's this knowledge sharing is important because once we figure it out we don't we, we don't want other people to make the same mistakes and that's kind of my mission and, and why I did such a big test. This upper right, that's the, I did a really big winter sow test by doing different seed densities. I did a control of two different potting soils, um, multiple jugs of the same, just so I could get, um, understand the variability. Um, and I took good data when I, when they, when they, sowed but the milk jug is is my recommended way to do the winter sow and uh, the reason that's important is that when i calculated the seed density it was based on that area which is like seven inches by seven inches so if, if you're if you're given seeds out or you're doing it yourself and they're not using the milk jug then just interpret interpolate or extrapolate based on the area that you are putting your um, seeds into and I mentioned earlier once that um, all my measurements, 
in the handout are for two milk jugs. So each seed envelope, you split that into two jugs uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, it makes the, it significantly reduces the time for your seed counting and the material cost. It's half the cost. It's half the envelopes, half the um, labels, which gets expensive. And, uh, but the fun reason to do too is that the gardeners can enjoy twice the plants. They can participate in this, in a plant swap um, in early June or donate a sec container to a friend or a community garden, which is what I did. That's this Watson Park. All those plants were grown by the community with, um, because I did like six or seven winter so workshops uh, last winter. And then everyone brought the milk jugs and we put them in early June. Um, we, we target 20 to 40 seedlings in the milk jug. Uh, and, th and that's based on the abundance of seed. If we don't have many, then I target 20. Um, also di different things like how, how many seeds fit in a, um, the measuring spoon. Um, and it was last last winter, it was my best guess based on the experience I had before. And then this year, what's in this handout is um, adjusted numbers based on the, the test that I did. And just use whatever measuring spoon you have, but count the first one and then and then you can um, just Im improvise from there to match the instructions as best you can. Um, that's the label to is 5160 if you want to do what I'm doing. And I'm happy to share my my templates, but it's that's the information that I, I put on there. Um, one of the most frequent question was which ones don't need cold stratification. So that's a detail that's being added to the label this year. Um, it's like C60 means 60 days in the winter. And for, for packaging, the, the reason I like to use these measuring spoons is it's reproducible and it's quicker than hand counting, the man, manual counting. Starting with clean bulk seed makes it reproducible. Don't the fluffy seeds, the windblown ones, when you're following this method, don't clean them further. Yes, you can take the shaft off, but but don't do it if you're trying to follow these instructions, like these upper right half tablespoon gently packed. So don't push them down. Yes, you can pack a whole lot of seeds in if you push them down, but gently pack means pull it out and just gently tap it until you get a level um, spoonful. And that's what gently packed means with, with the shaft. And then just being in the kitchen, you understand what a heaping um, teaspoon or a short teaspoon is, it's a little less, a little more. And you'll see that in the instructions a lot. And finally, good storage technique. Is this the, this is the last slide? Good storage technique means you want to keep. I I I have room in my refrigerator, so I put this big chunky thing wow. on the shelf in my refrigerator just because I have the room. But the basement, garage, somewhere cold would be would be good storage technique. And you don't there's inherent moisture left in the seed. That's a good thing. You don't want to put a desiccant bag or um, rice in there to dry it out further because whatever moisture is in there, inherent in there, that's that's fine. So don't try to do any technique to make it even more um, dry. And I, I just, I kept it simple and just use that label to hold the envelope closed. I'm gonna do it a bit differently. That's fine for most seeds, but those small ones I'm gonna put in a Ziploc bag this year. And I think that's it. This last slide are some references. This bottom one is a recording I did how I made the milk jug propagation container with a drill and a utility knife. Um, that's a record. The one above that is a workshop I, I recorded last year. I'm going to revise it a bit this year. So I'll have a new version uh, coming out. 
And then some seed companies were to buy seeds that are local enough to New England. And then uh, some Jagir stuff at the, at the top. All right, that's, that's a wrap. Are there any questions in the chat? Yeah, that was great. That was great. So thorough. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Brucey, are you monitoring this or people want to just raise their hand? There haven't been any questions in the chat um, that weren't already answered. That Our students who left were I'm wondering why you couldn't collect from parks and public and other um, public spaces. And I think Kelly took care of dropping a link from the slide and in, in the chat. So if anybody else has questions, have at it. It says the chat is disabled. I've saved it. I don't know why it's disabled. Um, well, I was gonna say, I don't actually have any questions because it's been, it's been so thorough that every time I had a question, you answered it in the next slide or two. So literally I, that doesn't happen often. So. Thank you. I have saved um, the chat in case there's anything that we need to, to share. I have a quick question. Um, a, a great, great talk. Um, you know, I, we, we uh, Prasad and myself had got some seeds from the Tough Pollinator Initiative and I took all a lot of trouble to make sure that I planted them uh, strat winter stratification and everything. But frankly, <laughs> None of them germinated. Zero. So I'm actually curious Zero. about the speaker as <laughs> to talk about the success. I mean, I mean, it's uh, you've you've okay, done a tremendous job talking about how well you collect the seeds, but what is your success rate? Oh, sure. Let me let me share my screen once more. I, I should have uh, thought of this. This is the Google Drive link that was shared, and I'm going to open the the workshop, the uh, handout. Um, that a lot of, a lot of information in here, but on the right side are my revised uh, seeds per envelope. And what that means is 40 times two means in that milk jug will go 40 seeds to milk jug. So they're going to be 80 seeds in the envelope. That's what that means. In 75, that's the data I collected, 75% viability. So you're going to get, uh, you can expect uh, 40 seeds times 0.75, so 32 whatever uh, seeds will germinate. The next group, uh, which is spotted St. John wort, 50% germination. And then the next one, 80% 80, 80, 80 germination, 60% germination. Um, I had trouble with some, like... Um, Let's see. Uh, I, for, I forget one of them. I oh the the yellow wild indigo zero percent germination. Also, I I I planted I sowed these on my back deck. Some of it was full sun. Some of it was full shade. And I'm so that was a, the the ones in full shade. They grew moss and had less germination. So I'm not doing that next year. I'm I'm proposing to everyone full sun or or mostly sun but not full shade so that impacted some of my some of my numbers too because my common common plants that started with a b c d e were next were in full shade and the ones the m n o p q r s were in full sun so <laughs> Uh, Mary, I would like to uh, circle back to Elise, who had a question. Um, it, 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 Hi there. Thank you for the talk. This has been awesome. Um, I have a few types of Monarda, and I, I have trouble with powdery mildew on all of them. So I, I wondered if, you know, can I still collect the seeds, or is that just going to continue to spread the powdery mildew? Uh, yeah, I don't think that hurts anything. It's 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 not mold like you get in that seed collection from the the mold will impact viability. That mildew on the leaves, you're fine. 
Okay, thank you very much. I have a question about storage. So you don't you don't pack seeds in you know a, a wet medium or peat, peat moss or anything in your fridge. You just put the the packet right into the refrigerator for your stratification. Yeah. Yeah, good, good storage technique is uh, storing it dry in the envelope. But yeah, I, I've done a lot of artificial stratification where I, where I did, did do that with success. Yeah, that test that you saw on my back deck with all the snow, mm -hmm. I had a, a test also going in my basement in my grow tent and under lights. I had a lot, I was doing a lot. I was busy all winter and I did a lot of artificial stratification and I started plants last um, last fall and I grew them all winter. And that test was to see if I could get flowers on the first year, because usually natives, they don't flower in the first year because they're developing the roots. My, my test was to um, get a good root system. So when I transplanted in the spring, they thought they were um, like two years old. <laughs> And um, but then I, I got busy and I, I didn't collect it. It was, <laughs> I think it worked, but I lost track. And you didn't talk about uh, scarification. Do you do that? Yeah, that's see, that's all part of uh, sewing, which oh. is not this. This is seed collection packaging. Then it's winter sow or direct sow. I do I do a workshop on that, um, but that's a different scarification. That's the part two. Got it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Part two. Yeah. Yeah. Next month. Mm. What are we offering next month, uh, Sarah? Do you want to say? Um, are you talking about the seed swap? We're yeah. going to do a seed swap. We're not having a regular meeting. We're going to be doing a seed swap the first weekend in November. And uh, we're hoping for Saturday afternoon, but it depends on the on the venue we get access to. So keep your calendars open and bring all your seeds. Um, and we'll, we'll learn a little bit about winter sow then as well from Gary, right? Right, Gary. And I'll have, I'll bring my equipment too. So everyone, if you have seed that needs cleaned, um, you're welcome to use the equipment. Oh, nice. Does that mean that you'll also bring a small handheld vacuum cleaner? To clean? <laughs> Maybe. Is there power? We're, we don't know where we're going yet. <laughs> right. Um, dust buster. I have a dust buster. Okay. Good. That sounds right. So I think we've missed out on some of the spring ones. I certainly have, unless we had put a bonnet on it or a um, bag. Uh, yeah, so my seeds will be all the ones that are available now, I think, and the milkweeds. Mm -hmm. Well, thank, thank you again for inviting me. It was a lot of fun to make this presentation and I feel really privileged that you asked me to uh, to present. Oh, it's a lot of fun to hear it and you put it a great deal of thought into this. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Yeah, no, thank you. You you such details. I loved it. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. All right. Everyone start start cleaning your seeds. Get ready for November 5th. <laughs> And remember, don't expect to clean any milkweed indoors if it's got the fluffy parts. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do that beforehand. Yes. All right. So, uh, Jean. Yeah. I have a new um, rain barrel for you. <gasps> oh, wonderful. Oh, thank it you. Is, it's new. It's been outside for like two years now, but we've never used it. Great, great. Yeah, before you join, people are trying to convince me to do some irrigation at this garden, but I think I, I would love to come by and get the, um, the barrel and also, 
we're going to stake it out this week. Um, I'll, I'll follow up on some plants with you too. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank thanks, Gary. Terrific. Thank you, Gary. I'll be in touch. All right. Well, thanks to all of you also. This is my first meeting, so I was glad to be here. Oh, great. Sorry, I'm not on screen. <laughs> Good. Well, glad you came. Guess we're going to call it a night. Um, okay. I'm going to stop recording. Okay. Thank you again, 